Our speaker this evening earned his Bachelor of Arts degree with, with distinction from the U University of Virginia with a double major in history and Spanish as well as his Doctor of Jurisprudence degree from the same institution. Born in the United States, Rafael Madden is the sixth of 10 children of Cuban parents. After several years in private law practice, he joined the US Department of Justice in 1991 and became general counsel of the department's Office of Justice programs in 2001. He has been an adjunct instructor of jurisprudence and constitutional law at Christendom College since 1996. Mr. Madden has served on several boards in the area. Most importantly though, he says this, we don't just insert it in his bio. He is a member of the board of directors of the Institute of Catholic Culture. Please welcome back Rafael Madden. The topic tonight is capitalism, corruption, and communion, Catholic economic theory, and the common good. A few thoughts just about the title. The first is that I think I could probably talk about this topic for a semester. And unfortunately, I have only a few minutes. So I'm going to have to not so much pare the subject down, but deal with the subject in a peculiar way. And I hope you'll be patient with me when I do so. The second thing I wanted to say, though, about the title and this isn't a criticism of the speaker, I, you know, this is my topic, right? Um, but the title is a big, huge, slimy, stinking mess. <laughs> and again, I mean no insult to the speaker. Um, and the reason it's a mess is because it's a mess in the way that most things are a mess nowadays. The words do not have clear meanings. It's important to remember as Catholics, we worship, of course, a triune God. We are, in fact, disciples, adopted children of God the Father. We adore God the Son, who is the eternal word. Words matter. And when people fuzzy the meaning of words up, they're not merely fuzzying the meaning of words up. They're doing something very dangerous and very bad. It is because words can have meaning that we're capable of talking to one another. And so it should be a little surprise to you that when the meaning of words becomes smeared, that we should stop talking to one another and we do a lot more screaming and yelling and throwing of bottles and that kind of thing. Um, communion. Do they mean a union of persons? Are we talking about the sacramental communion of husband and wife in a Christian marriage? Are we referring to the Holy Eucharist? Is it some occult reference to communism? Capitalism. Let's just say right now, I hate the word. I hate the word because although the term was used occasionally before 1867, it was used, or a variant of the term was used, the title of a hideous three-volume work by an awful set of Germans, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx. Their book is called Das Kapital, or Capital. The use of capital or capitalist, it's used 2,600 times in the work. Usually it's found in, so, in, in a clever German phrase, kapitalistische Produktionweise, or if you will, uh, the capitalist mode or means of production. Um, he needed something that he could set off against what his description was of socialism. And so he described the other thing as being capitalism, as though the other thing was a society or, a, or an economic system that was entirely driven by capital. And even there, what is capital? The, the entire book 
has the whiff and more than the whiff that capital is what other people, some people have stolen from others, pilfered from them, squeezed out of them, and then have used for their own nefarious ends somewhere. Well, I suppose if that's true, well, it looks a lot more like some kind of mafia thing, or it actually looks a lot more like a communist society, if you ask me. But the, um, you know, if that were true, then it would be rightly condemned. But unfortunately, um, that's what he referred to as capitalism. And so when people go, well, I support capitalism or whatever, which of those did you mean? The left constantly is uh, saying that, um, or screaming, I should say, but I repeat myself, uh, uh, is screaming about our capitalist system. And what they mean by that is that it, people are constantly expropriating, stealing, squeezing out of the others, and then they're just using it for their own ends. But uh, libertarians, they usually mean a system in which there is, or ideally, a completely free exchange, free markets, voluntary everythings, which we may or may not have, and we should or shouldn't have here. And conservatives, when they use the word capitalism, as usual, uh, they don't usually indicate that they have much understanding of what they mean. Um, uh, so they're vaguely for it, except for when they're not. Um, <laughs> corruption, corruption of what? Corruption of society? of individuals, morals. You know, the very term suggests the existence of an ideal from which there's been a falling off or some kind of falling away. But in the title, and again, I'm not trying to criticize the speaker, because that would be stupid. Uh, the title doesn't say. We then move to Catholic economic theory. Is there such a thing? I remember hearing live, I was on this, uh, the Senate staff at the time, Senator Kennedy, I did not work for him, of Massachusetts. He said on the floor of the Senate to no other senators, because there was no other senators in the room, as is usual in the Senate, um, <laughs> everyone would be asleep. He said, some call it socialism, I call it the Sermon on the Mount. And, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, yeah, it's, it's just like what the Lord says, give everything that your neighbor has to the poor. Um, <laughs> now, did he mean, is Catholic economic theory something like the distributism uh, that was uh, made popular by G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc? Or was it the economics of a very famous Catholic of the 19th century, Lord Acton, which is seen by some as approaching libertarianism, although I think that's unfair to Lord Acton. Um, you know, it's important, just I'm gonna touch on this point, it's important to remember that we live in an, an age of global economics, for good or ill, that's where we are. That doesn't mean we have to remain here, it just means that I'm just describing where we are, right? And in many ways, what it has produced is untold wonders. You know, things that, that emperors and kings could have, might have dreamt about are the stuff that you can get at the 7-Eleven. I mean, you, nothing. It, it, not only can everybody get it, but it's practically free. Um, and that, whenever we criticize our economic system, and I think there's much to criticize, I think we mustn't forget that it's also served as a mechanism by which untold millions upon millions of people have been lifted out of dreadfully precarious existences where they might well have starved with all of their families and with no one remembering even their names. You know, we, there, there have been tremendous advances that we mustn't forget as we discuss or think about the title of tonight's topic. 
And finally, we come to the common good. Um, I was at Mass two weeks ago, and this probably tells you something about how ornery I am, but you've already guessed. Uh, in the prayers of the faithful, let us pray for the success and increase of government programs for something or other. And I, I thought to myself, well, I, I won't tell you what I... <laughs> um, you know, is that the common good? Um, uh, you know, they, we heard a legislator in the state legislature in Alabama speaking against a bill in Alabama that would have virtually um, abolished abortion within the state. And he said, look, certain group of people a certain group of people, look, they're just going to become drug addicts and commit crimes and we're going to have to execute them later. So it's either now or then. Is that the common good? <laughs> you know, the fact that people actually uttered that and there wasn't universal condemnation, in fact there was a lot of uh-huhs, um, may tell us something about the society we live in. Um, and it occurred to me that uh, as I was thinking about all of these different things that go, go into this title, that there were some people who have, well, there's a lot of people who've thought about this before, but um, there's at least one uh, author who has actually uh, provided me with a great deal of, of the background and much of the foreground of what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight. This is Anthony Esselin, who's probably familiar to many or most, perhaps all of you. Um, he has written a wonderful book uh, that I encourage all of you to read called Reclaiming Catholic Social Teaching. Um, in his book, you know, he, he has the following uh, paragraph. Imagine a lawyer returning his fee when he loses a case. Imagine a television pundit suddenly admitting that he has no idea what he's talking about. Imagine a Hollywood starlet speaking English. Imagine the Cubs winning the World Series. Imagine anything most absurd and you have not yet approached the absurdity of those who claim that Catholic social teaching implies the existence of a vast welfare state, bureaucratically organized, unanswerable to the people, undermining families, rewarding lust and sloth and envy, acknowledging no virtue, providing no personal care, punishing women who take care of their children at home, whisking the same children away from parental supervision and into schools designed to separate them from their parents' views of the world. And for all that, keeping whole segments of the population mired in a cycle of dysfunction, dysfunction, moral squalor, and poverty, while purchasing their votes with money squeezed by force from their neighbors. Hoo-hoo! The common good! <laughs> Catholic social teaching. But this is what you hear from so many. Now, they don't put it in those terms. But that is the result of what they've done and what they keep pushing. And we say, well, you know, I'm not sure that these are really good results. They say, that's right, so that's why we need more of them. It makes perfect sense. <sighs> Those of you who know me know that I, um, well, I don't like modern things. Um, and I could speak for a good long time, perhaps a full semester, but I have only a few minutes with you tonight. And given the heat, perhaps you're welcome. Perhaps even if it were much cooler, you'd still be welcome. I'm happy that, uh, that it's only a few minutes. I spoke earlier about two repellent men from 19th century German. I'm now going to speak to you about a 19th century Italian count. Um, he was born in 1810, but he lived a good long life. He died in 1903. Count Vincenzo Pecci. Uh, you might know him by a different name because he was one of these secret Catholic people. He took on a different name later in life. You know him as Leo the Thirteenth. He was the third longest reigning pope uh, to date. 
and the oldest pope. Um, he was, uh, as a result of the historical circumstances of the Vatican uh, following what is sometimes mistakenly called the reunification or the unification of Italy, uh, he was a pope who spent his entire pontificate as a prisoner of the Vatican. He lived within the, vol the walls of the Vatican. He did not step outside those walls once he was elected pope. Um, he fought constantly with the powers of the Italian government. And uh, his entire pontificate was a dreadful cross. But he was no fool. He was a very wise man. And he made use of something that popes have made use of since St. Peter. Letters to the faithful. Uh, he made use of encyclical letters and of letters that weren't of the same gravity as encyclical letters as a way of getting the message out, as a way of evangelizing, as a way of communicating the faith to his brothers and sisters in the rest of the world. And ever since then, popes have followed his example. Now, they had done so before. I'm not going to say he invented the encyclical by any means. But he's the one who said, I can use this, and I can use it well, and I can use it often, and I'm going to do so. The, he wrote 88 encyclicals during his pontificate. Um, uh, just to go through some of the, he wrote three or four encyclicals on the Most Holy Rosary. Uh, he wrote many encyclicals on reunion with the Eastern churches. Uh, he wrote many, many encyclicals on Freemasonry and secularism in society. Among his most famous encyclicals are Inscrutabili Dei Concilio on the evils of uh, society at large nowadays. That was in 1878, on the, the year he was elected. In, uh, in, in that same year, Quod Apostolici Muneris, uh, in which he condemned socialism. 1879, Eterni Patris, which restored Thomism, or called for the restoration of Thomism in seminaries across the world. He said, we've forgotten Aquinas. This is a bad idea. In 1880, Arcanum Divine Sapientiae on Christian marriage. It's a hymn to marriage. It's a magnificent encyclical on marriage. I encourage you to read it. Uh, after that, read Casti Canubi. If that, those two don't blow your socks off, nothing will. In 1885, Immortale Dei on the Christian constitution of states. That is, what, to the mind of a Christian, should a state look like? What should a government how should a government behave? What, should, what would we, as Christians, consider to be a decent government? In 1891, his most famous encyclical, Rerum Novarum, and in 1902, Mire Caritatis on the Eucharist. Now, Largely because of his encyclical Rerum Novarum, uh, he has been seen as sort of the father of Catholic social teaching. A bit about that in a moment. I say largely because, because I'm not sure that a whole lot of people read Rerum Novarum. A lot of people mention it. They, they, they cite it. Here's the name of it. Um, I remember when I was in school, uh, I was told that it was uh, the, an encyclical that just began Catholic social te teaching, apparently hadn't existed before that year. Um, and he was very optimistic, that's why it starts with the title, New Things. And um, he supported s the implementation of social programs and labor unions. That's rerum novarum for high school kids. Um, in point of fact, I get the idea that, that the the, the nun who said those words uh, hadn't or cannot have read the opening sentence of Rerum Novarum. Rerum Novarum is often since on new things, um, but in fact, the sentence is, refers to the spirit of revolutionary change. Revolutionary change is the Rerum Novarum. The spirit of revolutionary change 
which has long been disturbing the peace of the nations of the world. It's a condemnatory sentence. He doesn't like it. His encyclical starts with a loud trumpet blast that the spirit of revolutionary change, which has long been disturbing the peace of the nations of the world, should have passed beyond the sphere of politics and made its influence felt in the cognate sphere of practical economics is not surprising. The elements of the conflict now raging are unmistakable in the vast expansion of industrial pursuits and the marvelous discoveries of science, in the changed relations between masters and workmen, in the enormous fortunes of some few individuals, and the utter poverty of the masses. There, the increased self-reliance and closer mutual combination of the working classes, and also, finally, in the prevailing moral degeneracy. The momentous gravity of the state of things now obtaining fills every mind with painful apprehension. Wise men are discussing it. Practical men are proposing schemes. Popular meetings, legislatures, and rulers of, rulers of nations all are busied with it. Actually, there is no question which has taken deeper hold on the public mind. So he goes on to say that because the church is concerned about the common good, we have thought it expedient now to speak on the condition of the working classes. It is a subject upon, we have already, upon which we've already touched more than once. But in the present letter, the responsibility of the apostolic office urges us to treat the question of set purpose and detail in order that no misapprehension may exist as to the principles which truth and justice dictate for its settlement. Now, just so that it, there's no question about how worrisome this is, that this is a big, fat, hairy deal. Th that's not the Pope's language. <laughs> the discussion is not easy, nor is it void of danger. It is no easy matter to define the relative rights and mutual duties of the rich and the poor, of capital and of labor. And the danger lies in this, that crafty agitators, it sounds like he's like watching our TV set, <laughs> are intent on making of these differences of opinion, uh, on the making of these differences of opinion to pervert men's judgment and to stir up the people to revolt. Um, he talks about, it, by degrees it has come to pass that working men have been surrendered, isolated and helpless to the hard-heartedness of employers and the gr uh, greed of unchecked competition. The mischief has been increased by rapacious usury, which, although more than once condemned by the church, is nevertheless under a different guise and with like injustice still practiced by covetous and grasping men. Um, to remedy these wrongs, the socialist, working on the poor man's envy of the rich, here he sounds a note that should never be forgotten. At the heart of socialism is envy. One of the capital sins, as a, as a co happy coincidence. They strive to do away with private property and contend that individual possession should become common property to all, to be administered by the state. They hold that by thus transferring property from private individuals to the community, the present state of things will be set to right, each, inasmuch as each citizen then will get his fair share of what there is to enjoy. Um, but he says that it would be a disaster. He goes on to say that moreover, it would be emphatically unjust. It wouldn't succeed in doing what it wants. And second, it would be unjust even if it did. Um, uh, socialists, by endeavoring to transfer the possessions of individuals to the community at large, strike at the interests of every wage earner, since they would deprive him of the liberty of disposing of his own wages, and thereby all hope and possibility of increasing his own resources and bettering his condition in life. He's worried about that, because he sees that every person has great possibilities. Every person is open to what? To heaven. 
And if you're open to heaven, what can't you do here? You know, if, you, <laughs> if you can get eternity, hey, you might even be able to do a good job here too. Uh, just making sure I keep my grasp on things. Anthony Esselin here. Pope Leo XIII is credited as being the founder of Catholic social teaching. He would have been appalled. He intended nothing other than to apply to current concerns what Jesus taught his apostles and what they handed down to their successors. His thoughts prescind not from the nature of the spanking new modern state, nor from social advances sometimes more apparent than real, but from the changeless nature of man. He looked at what is man? What is man for? What is man's vocation? He never supposed that one could devise any social teaching without understanding what a society is to begin with, without, which requires that we understand what human beings are, and more importantly, why human beings are. For what end God has made human beings? Leo surveys the world from the mountaintop of faith, not from the mercurial ingenuity of a vain scholar or the meddlesome pride of an inter innovator. I can't do better than Esalen. I mean, my gosh, I just quote the guy. So I sound great when I do that, right? So, how does Leo begin his social teaching? Well, He begins it with a discussion of the family. You, you, might, you might be surprised, you know, on the condition of the working man, whatever, whatever. He spends paragraphs talking about the family. Uh, okay. Leo, this is Esalen again. Leo never speaks about economics without directing his steady gaze at the household and the family. The love of man and woman bound in holy matrimony and the children they rear. It isn't that a society is made up of families. This is important. It isn't that a society is made up of families the way a factory is made up of bricks. It's that each family itself is a society. And each Christian family is a domestic church. It's not that, gosh, all these bricks together equal some magnificent house. It's that each one of them is itself a society. And this is a point to which Leo returns over and over and over. The family is anterior to society. And, you know, it, it is no less perfect than a state or a village or a city. And so he says... It's not as though the state, well, you know, what are the rights of one or the other? He says, the family comes first. Not merely because it's, it's, it started first, but the state exists to support the family. That's the purpose of the state. We get it all wrong nowadays. We get it entirely wrong. He wasn't, refer he wasn't just giving practical advice on how to maintain harmony under the roof. He was affirming the real analogy in being between Christian marriage and the union of Christ in the church, which is the perfect society, the perfect fellowship of love. Therefore, laws that strike at the holiness of marriage attack the heart of the church and civil society. This is Pope Leo. When impious laws setting at naught the sanctity of this great sacrament, put it on the same footing as mere civil contracts. The lamentable result followed that outraging the dignity of Christian matrimony, citizens made use of legalized concubinage in place of marriage. Husband and wife neglected their bound duties to each other, Children refused obedience and reverence to their parents. The bonds of domestic love were loosened. And alas, the worst scandal and of all the most ruinous to public morals, very frequently an unholy passion opened the door to disastrous and fatal separations. 
it sounds like a <laughs> report on the modern family in the United States. And here he is writing in 1891. Good laws, according to Eslin, teach, but so do bad laws. Good laws assist us in the difficult pursuit of virtue. Bad laws thwart that pursuit and encourage vice. The bad law that allows for disastrous and fatal separations, to quote the Pope, that is, divorces, is like a rotten trunk from which only worthless fruits can come. The disease that breaks out in the home spreads, to quote the Pope, cruel infection to the hurt and injury of citizens. When the domestic life is Christian, the members of the society of the hearth will learn the habits of piety and obedience and mutual service. Again, to quote the Pope, to the restraint of that insatiable seeking after self-interest alone, which spoils and weakens the character of men. You know, the, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Right? He's talking about uh, weakening and spoiling the character of individual human beings because there's nothing or there are fewer restraints on the insatiable seeking after self-interest alone. I'm quoting again Esselin. Let me put it as bluntly as I can. Divorce violates the social teaching of the church. Laws that facilitate divorce are socially destructive. If that's true, then all the more may we say that, that fornication violates the social teaching of the church. Laws that encourage such things are socially destructive. To train young people in safe fornication is to plant the seeds of cancer in the very heart. Well said, Anthony. Now, Pope Leo says, it is a most sacred law of nature that a father should provide food and all necessaries for them, those whom he has begotten. It's a most sacred law of nature that if, uh, oh, and similarly, it's natural that he should wish that his children, who carry on, so to speak, and continue his personality. He refers here to fathers. I think nowadays we might understand this to be both parents. They should be by him provided with all that is needful to enable them to keep themselves decently from want and misery amid the uncertainties of this moral life. Now, in no other way can a father effect this except by the ownership of productive property which he can transmit to his children by inheritance. A family, no less than a state, is, as we have said, a true society, governed by an authority peculiar to itself, that is to say, by the authority of the parents. Provided, therefore, the limits which are prescribed by the very purposes for which it exists be not transgressed, the family has at least equal rights with the state in the choice and pursuit of the things needful to its preservation and its just liberty. We say at least equal rights, for inasmuch as the domestic household is antecedent, inasmuch as the family is prior to the state, as well in idea as in fact to the gathering of men into a community, the family must necessarily have rights and duties which are prior to those of the community and founded more immediately in nature itself. If the citizens if the families on entering into association and fellowship were to experience hindrance in a commonwealth instead of help and were to find their rights checked and attacked instead of being upheld, society would be an object of detestation. He's referring to our society. I hate to say it. The contention then that the civil government should at its option intrude into and exercise intimate control over the family and the household is a great and pernicious error. True, if a family finds itself in exceeding distress, 
utterly deprived of the counsel of friends and without any prospect of extricating itself, it is right that extreme necessity be met by public aid, since each family is part of the commonwealth. In like manner, if within the precincts of the household there occur grave disturbance of mutual rights. He's, you know, when he talks about the authority of a father in the house, the, the authority of parents, he's, he's not saying, oh, well, I don't care if there's abuse. Who cares? Oh, that's just on the margin. It doesn't matter. He recognizes it. Public authority should intervene to force each party to yield to the other its proper due. For this is not to deprive citizens of their rights. You don't have a, new, a right to abuse. Um, but the rulers of the commonwealth must go no further. Here, nature bids them stop. Paternal authority can be neither abolished nor absorbed by the state, for it has the same source as human life itself. Um, what an upset and disturbance there would be in all classes, and how intolerable and hateful a slavery citizens would be subjected to. The door would be thrown open to envy, to mutual invective, to discord. The sources of wealth themselves would run dry, for no one would have any interest in exerting his talents or his industry, and that ideal equality about which they entertain pleasant dreams, the socialists, would be in reality the leveling down of all to a like condition of misery and degradation. Has any of you been traveling to Venezuela recently? <laughs> it is clear that the main tenet of socialism, community of goods, must be utterly rejected since it only injures those whom it would seem to benefit, is directly contrary to the natural rights of mankind, and, and would introduce confusion and disorder into the commonweal. The first and most fundamental principle, therefore, if one would undertake to alleviate the condition of the masses, must be the inviolability of private property. The inviolability of private property. I'll say it again, the inviolability of private property. This being established, we proceed to show where the remedy for problems must be found. It's not there. It's not the taking of one. It's not the taking from one for the supposed benefit of another. You know, I did say Venezuela. I might just as well have said Cuba, a subject about which I know a lot more. My parents knew a lot about Cuba, too, which is why they, don't, they didn't live there when they, my father died. <laughs> the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, I don't have to add correctly, uh, I need to pull it out, sorry. The human person needs to live in society. Society is not for him an extraneous addition, but a requirement of his nature, a requirement of his nature. Through the exchange with others, mutual service, and dialogue with his brethren, man develops his potential. He thus responds to his vocation. That's where I'm going to head. What is the society that the Catechism is talking about? First and foremost, that society is the family. What is man's vocation? I don't know if any of you have ever heard of any of the councils of Baltimore from the 19th century, uh, but they produced a number of catechisms that many of you may have heard of sometime. The vocation of man is to know, love, and serve the Lord in this life, and to be happy with him in the next. That's why we're here. That's what we're for. We have no other purpose. If we do anything contrary to that, there's no point. Okay? We're actually frustrating what we're made for. It's a little bit like, I don't know, you've got a car or something, and you say, well, I'm going to use it as a, well, I don't know what, something to bake bread. Um, now, I've, there is a, a cookbook called Manifold Destiny, which tells you how to <laughs> cook on a car, but I, I'm a little creeped out by that. I'm not sure that I would like it. Um, 
Thus, under Catholic social teaching, the measure of all that we do has to be found in the question of, is what we're doing conducive to our vocation? Is it ordered towards our vocation? Is it made, is it done in such a way as to facilitate the accomplishment of our vocation? That is, does it enable us better to know, love, and serve the Lord in this life? If it doesn't, we don't want it. We shouldn't have it. It's not good for us. It's contrary to Catholic social teaching. The idea that you can have Catholic social teaching utterly divorced from the rest of the teachings of the church is plainly and simply wrong. The church's teachings are all of a piece. We hear a great deal about freedom to choose. And the libertarians would have it that such is the highest good. And they point correctly to the wild prosperity that the liberty to make economic choices in the free market has produced. But the free exchange that leaves all parties better is what they're talking about. But my question is, is it really free if it's not conducive to our vocation, if it's not ordered to our vocation? Let me be more specific. Do we have the right to sell ourselves into slavery? You know, I've heard people say, well, we should legalize prostitution. Because, you know, hey, come on, everybody's better off. Well, the question is, is it conducive to our vocation? That's what tells you whether we're better off. I don't know whether economically or not it makes, you know, it might make some economic sense. Uh, but it doesn't make Catholic economic sense. And in this room, I would suppose that that's the only thing we should be concerned about. Certainly the only thing I'm concerned about. Uh, the, the libertarians don't typically, and I'm trashing libertarians, I shouldn't do that, many. It's, it's, a, it's a wide movement that, that has all kinds. Some of them are vehemently contra uh, opposed to abortion, others are not. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand many of their premises. Uh, they, they seem often not to count the costs of addiction, the ruined lives, the personal degradation that comes from the concept of freedom that just becomes you can do whatever you want. Freedom meaning nothing more than freedom from restraint. So the highest good is simply being allowed to do whatever you feel like. As I said, our question is, free, the, the definition of freedom under Catholic social teaching is the freedom to do what is conducive to our vocation. What is conducive to knowing, loving, and serving God better. Oh, and here I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but practically quoting Leo. A society's laws should be conducive to the widest possible freedom to know, love, and serve God. That should be our test for whether or not a particular um, action should or should not be taken. Now, reasonable minds might differ as to whether this particular legislative action or this particular activity is or isn't conducive. But as long as we're asking the same question and we're asking the same question legitimately, then I suppose if reasonable minds can't differ, if the church is not pronounced definitively on the subject, then we have to hope that uh, you know, we, we persuade people to what we believe to be right, and if not, then in all charity, we say, well, I'm, I'm supposing that you're, you desire the same good that I do. I don't see that you're gonna get there, but you've won, I wish you all the best. Um, I'm pointing to you only because you're right in front of me. <laughs> I'm sure we wouldn't disagree. Um, I'd like to have an opportunity to make money to set my family up and become a wealthy patron of the church. Okay, so the church would say. 
but be careful. We all know about the eye of the needle and the wealthy man who built his barns to, to no avail. Still, there's nothing wrong in saying I'd like to you know, use the fruit of my labor, the, the resources that I have available, be available in order to better my family's economic condition and in order to support the church better later. Now this is different from I'd like the opportunity to oppress my employees, uh, to defraud my customers or creditors, to exploit the weaknesses of my fellow men by selling them or purveying drugs, by selling to them or purveying drugs, uh, by, by uh, how do I put this, preying on their weaknesses, things that they don't especially need. I don't usually watch much in the way of television, and when I, uh, one time I had the horror of watching Saturday morning television where they have all these particularly idiotic cartoons, but they're mostly uh, occasions for the selling of innumerable toys that all look, you know, well, they're dreadful. And it's all about sort of giving them some kind of a sugar habit. You know, they drumming up some kind of a demand. You know, I would think that they're preying on the weaknesses of the children. Um, and then on the weaknesses of the parents who don't want to resist the blandishments of the children. Um, you know, are we purveying uh, mass entertainment uh, that chills belief and love of family? If we are, that's not a good thing. How about on the other side? I'd like the opportunity to gain, to earn a fair wage. Sounds great. I encourage you to do that. As opposed to, I'd like to get paid in full for shoddy work. Or I'd like to be paid in full even though I have less than full devotion to my employer. Now, Leo talks a great deal about rights and obligations. Employers have obligations to their employees and they have rights as against their employees. And employees have rights as against their employers and obligations to their employers. Now I do want to stress one thing here I'm not referring to. I, I've talked a little bit about government programs and that kind of thing. There are federal programs and state programs. Um, many things might or might not be permissible on the federal level because of what the U.S. Constitution may or may not say, than what may be, as opposed to what may be permissible on the state level. I'm not going to speak to that. I'm referring to government in some generic sense, even though that's not a particularly good way to, to talk about it. You know, some things are permitted to the federal government that aren't permitted to the states. Some things are permitted to the states that aren't permitted to the federal government. Um, Leo makes it clear, and I'm not going to quote anymore, that employees should actually love their fellow laborers and should love those for whom they work. And employee, employers should love those who work for them. It doesn't say that they should be nice. Uh, I had a discussion with a friend of mine. Sometimes uh, one has the impression nowadays that the two central teachings of the Catholic Church are be nice and don't litter. But um, I think that the church teaches something more than that. We're called to love those who are around us. Um, they should have a mutual concern for each other's material, spiritual, and moral Welfare. Leo goes on at great length. The worker must always be allowed all the opportunity possible in order to attend to all of his religious obligations and to his family obligations. If there's a crisis or something in the family, employers should make accommodation for this kind of thing because the employer should recognize that the family is first. And the employer should love his employee and want that family to succeed. Um, when he calls us to love our neighbor, he of course is calling us to love our obnoxious neighbor as well as our not obnoxious neighbor, um, our depressed neighbor as well as our happy neighbor, and the one who's a pleasure to be with as well as the one who's not. I had the unpleasant circumstance about eight d days ago of listening to someone talking to someone else and, and saying that um, 
Well, ethics are nothing more than what a society, actually you said ethics is, but ethics are nothing more than a, uh, what a society agrees upon. So I, I thought to myself, so your only objection to Hitler then is that he was distasteful or aesthetically displeasing. I mean, so we've now gotten to your only condemnation of Hitler is that he was tacky? You know, I'm sorry. I won't deprive myself of that moral vocabulary. Um, there is such a thing as objective morals. Um, and to anyone who takes the time to try to discover them, they're discoverable. And Leo tells us over and over and over, society's laws need to be based on those objective morals. If society isn't built around a common shared understanding of what is good and true and right, it isn't really a society at all. It's a multitude, or maybe better, a swarm of individuals, each vying for his own thing and control of the levers of power to the destruction of all. Um, in fact, I think it looks a lot like the society we live in, where we have mass ignorance of history, mass entertainment, mass politics, mass media, mass education, and very little mass attendance. <laughs> we don't have a good society. I think, I think we have a goods society. Uh, to quote um, Brad Gregory in his wonderful book, The Unintended Reformation, uh, we have, in fact, what Edmund Burke wrote about in his magnificent reflections on the revolution in France. Um, uh, what we have is, is corruption. Read Leo. Thank you very much. You mentioned in passing at the beginning um, Chesterton and Belloc's distributism. And given the richness of the argument that followed, I was wondering if I, I was wondering if you could offer your opinion on whether distributism is a rich response to uh, rerum novarum, whether it's it sort of encapsulates what you're talking about or not quite. Would love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, distributism is I think a faithful response to rerum novarum, unlike many, both on the right and the left. I mean, I think people sort of often look into rerum novarum, find what they want to see, and then they say, there, see? Um, I don't think that's true of distributism. The, the difficulty with distributism is that it, it, it speaks of an ideal, um, and it, it's not particularly good at, at describing how to get there. Uh, in, in, a, in the crudest possible way, I'll describe it, it's, it's, it's uh, Belloc and Chesterton both advocated the widest possible distribution of property. Not, not the forcible redistribution of property, but they wanted as many people to own as many possible things as possible. There's a lot of possibles in there. Um, they, they, they thought that that society would be best where it was filled with small shop owners, people who ran their own shops, who employed people from the neighborhood, uh, where things were done at the lowest level, rather than at you know, some you know, global consolidated foods in some place that nobody ever heard of. Um, uh, how, that, how that could be brought about is, is unclear. In many ways, I, ironically, the, the the very globalized economy we live in has permitted things like microbreweries and micro enterprises to exist, has enabled people to make money off of small organic farms. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to, to get a market for them, but they can reach out to different people and just enough of them to carve out niches uh, where they can um, uh, then sort of live out that kind of dream. I think that it's important to read the texts of the distributists because they had something to say that is valuable and well within the church's teaching and well within the church's tradition. Thank you. We have a question coming in online from Melanie Allard. She writes, in paragraph 22 of Rerum Navarum, Leo makes it clear that the right to private property 
is real, but never absolute. What is one real life situation where you believe the state has a right or even a responsibility to appropriate private property for the sake of the common good? Yeah, the, the, first of all, I mean, a very simple answer to that question is where the state takes things by, by eminent domain in order to build roads or highways or dams. I guess roads and highways are the same thing, but to build dams or, or, or in order to uh, shore up hillsides and things like that where there might be danger or to prevent fires, uh, this sort of thing. So that's a very simple answer. I don't want to be unfair to the questioner by, by leaving it there. I'm not so sure that I read the, the 22nd paragraph as being uh, one where he talks about where, where he justifies or attempts to justify uh, the expropriation of property. Uh, that might come later in an encyclical of Paul VI where there's uh, some discussion about this and he talked in uh, Paul VI encyclical talked about breaking up a very large farms. It might be he hazards it as a possibility. It is very clear that in this 22nd paragraph, um, Leo asks the question, you know, how must one's possessions be used? And he's pretty severe on the rich. He says, your property isn't, the, yes, you have the right to your property, but it, you don't it's been given to you for your vocation, for your salvation. You will be asked, you know, when I was naked, when I was hungry, when I was starved, did you feed me? And so he says uh, that no one is commanded to, true, no one is commanded to distribute to others that which is required for his own needs and those of his household, nor even to give away what is reasonably required to becomingly, to keep up becomingly his condition in life. For no one ought to live other than becomingly. But when, but when necess, what necessity demands has been supplied, and one standing fairly taken thought for, it becomes a duty to give to the indigent what remains over. He's telling the rich, you've been given a great privilege. You've been given the ability to improve the lot of your fellow man. Do it for your own sake. Thank you. Um, you made an interesting observation, quoting Pope Leo, to the effect that employers should love their employees and employees love their employers. Um, I know that's fairly difficult if your employer is a large publicly traded corporation with millions of shareholders scattered all over uh, the country, and uh, and yet it's the system of uh, that allows uh, such a wide variety of owners to pool their capital that has made possible an, uh, the uh, great affluence of our society, which has also brought a lot of people out of abject poverty. Um, does Pope Leo's observation say that, suggests that there ought to be limits on the ability to organize enterprises in this kind of, of uh, impersonal um, uh, you know, stock uh, corporation form. He doesn't speak directly to that question. In fact, when I said you should love, he refers, uh, I was paraphrasing, those aren't exactly the Holy Father's words. First of all, wherever you are, there you are. Um, you can start with the people who are around you at work. You can start by working faithfully, you know, and, and giving a full, an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. You can say, oh, you know, if I, if I take these things from the company, it's not like anybody notices. Well, you know what? God the Father in highest heaven notices. And that isn't the kind of thing you would do to people that you love. So even though the people that you love, by not taking things from them, may never know that you engaged in this act of love, your father who sees your heart in secret uh, will know it. He doesn't speak to stock corporations, at least that I can uh, recall right now. Um, I think it would have dumbfounded him at some level. 
Um, and it isn't because he wasn't clever. There were such a thing as stock corporations and all. But uh, they were... I don't know that public trading uh, had existed such as to create unbelievable amounts of capital. There were, you know, such publicly traded corporations as there were typically had very important stockholders and they would be the ones who would sign and get loans and that kind of thing. Um, I think this would have been beyond his, his very fertile imagination. Um, and I appreciate that it's a real problem. I mean, how do you love Coca-Cola? Yeah, well, if you're in the South, then you do love Coca-Cola, but, <laughs> but I meant the corporation. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, uh, but you can at least love those who are around you. You know, we're supposed to love our neighbor, and in some sense, our neighbor includes those who are in Africa and Asia and far and far away. Uh, but what is it? Is it Mrs. Jellybee in, in, um, in Dickens who treated her own children awfully, but she constantly was the orphans in Africa, um, but her own children were awful. Um, you know, she was full of charity, but to no one around her. Uh, Chesterton referred to the philanthropist as someone who loves mankind and hates individual men. Um, uh, you can at least love those who are around you, th those whom the Lord happens to put into your path. Uh, so one day we're going to have a chance to talk to the Lord about it and we can tell him how ticked, our, ticked off we are that he put these nasty people in our path. Um, until then, make the best of it. <laughs> we'll end with this question from Teresa. She's writing in online and says, one of the quotes said something to the effect that with welfare, only if a family lacks friends and any other means of support from their community should a government step in to assist that family. Can you please elaborate on this point and how this relates to Acts, where the disciples shared and held their goods in common? Yeah, it's important. I mean, remember also, St. Paul tells us that, you know, those who don't work don't eat. Um, uh, the model that we see in Acts is lived in our world. Uh, we call these places monasteries, okay, where people dis dispossess, they, they, they divest themselves of their possessions and they go in to live a communal life where everything is held in common, where each works unstintingly. That's a very difficult thing to do outside of a monastery. Um, Precisely because, you know, St. Paul himself talks about it, about, the, you know, the husband is concerned about his wife and his children. And he should be! You know, it's not like, oh, gosh, terrible husband, if only he would care for other people and not his family. <laughs> you know, I mean, he has a duty. Uh, parents have a duty to their children. A husband and wife have a mutual obligation to one another that's higher to uh, other kinds of obligations. Um... The, the quote from uh, the Holy Father's letter, it, how do I put this? Nowadays, there's something about the suffocating character of government. How many times have you thought, well, you know, oh, gosh, I already gave so much for taxes or whatever. Am I going to give something to this bum on the street? Now, I suppose we shouldn't be thinking bum on the street. He's a person redeemed by Almighty God every bit. The, every bit as much of a vocation as you and I have to get to heaven. It was Mother Teresa who said that the Lord appears in disguises, and sometimes many, sometimes they're very distressing. Um, but it's kind of like they already took how many, you know, how many dollars am I going to be giving for this? And it's easy then to say I gave at the office. You know, it's it's, it's somebody else's business because the government's doing it. If the government weren't doing it, or were doing it only at short term and only in the direst cases, you wouldn't have such an easy time of that argument, would you? You'd have to say, actually, I am my brother's keeper. I am responsible. I am here to be this person's neighbor. Um, the suffocating character of government can take that away and make it very easy, with some justification, to say, eh, let it go.
Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Madden.